thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a pleasure to give a talk in Nottingham, even though online. I mean, it's not my it's my second time in Nottingham. I've been the first time about five years ago, but in person back then. And maybe even talked at, about something related, but uh, maybe more on the quantum cohomology side of the story. And um, right, so let's uh, let's get going. Maybe one uh, remark is that I have shared my slides so that it's easier for you to follow, but I don't really know how they got shared. So maybe um, Al could tell where to find them, so to speak. And uh, right. if you want to see the slides, then you should open up the um, chat, the conversation, and I put a link there. Yeah, so I, I'm going to use my slides as we go along, but kind of to, to ease, uh, I mean, to make it easier to follow, you can just download the full set of slides and then you can go back and so on, or even forth. All right, um, so let's uh, get going. So the title is on the screen, so it's Residual Categories of Grassmannians, and um, it is a joint work uh, with Alexander Kuznetsov. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, from the beginning, so to speak, uh, by recalling what is an exceptional collection, but probably many of you have seen this before, so I apologize uh, for getting you bored at the beginning. Hopefully it's going to get better as we go along. So. For today, I'll always assume that we have a smooth projective variety over the complex numbers, and dBx is a bounded derived category of coherent sheaves on X. And uh, if you're uncomfortable with derived categories, you can just think of, uh, whenever I say an object in the derived category, think of a vector bundle uh, on, on the variety X. And, uh, right. and so now we are ready to give our first definition. So an object of the derived category is called exceptional, if the following two properties hold, the homes from E to E are as small as possible, namely generated by the identity homomorphism, and there are no, no other self extensions. And like I said, feel free to uh, think about vector bundles. Right, and so that's the first definition. Second definition, say if we have a sequence, an ordered sequence of exceptional objects, it is called an exceptional collection, if for every uh, i greater than j, we have such a vanishing of x groups. And it should vanish for all k. Right? And finally, the last part is that if we have an exceptional collection, E1 to En, it is said to be full if it generates the derived category in some sense. Well, in some precise sense, and uh, well, and in this case, we will write uh, db is equal to, and then such triangular brackets around this e1 to en. Maybe fine print. I mean, this more precisely means that the smallest full triangulated subcategory containing all of these objects is equivalent to the whole dbx. Well, fullness is a very important concept in this business, but somewhat technical, and we'll mostly ignore it for today. All right, so let's. Uh, Let's keep going. So let's let's do some examples. Well, in any talk on exceptional collections, you have an example of Bellinson. So let's do it. So projective space. So this case was treated by Alexander Bellinson in around uh, 1978, and the legend says that it was something like his bachelor thesis or even some kind of undergraduate uh, paper that he has written. Anyhow, the claim is that the derived category of PN has this uh, full exceptional collection consisting of the uh, of the twisting sheaves O of one, etc., until O of n. And um, right, this is our first example. And second example is uh, also historically, in a sense, were Grassmannians, GKN, and Quadrix. So this was uh, this is the work of Kapranov at about 1983. And uh, well, it's too much to recall the full setting, but let's do just one example, which is both a Grassmannian and a Quadric, namely Grassmannian 2-4. And the claim is this, that these objects, which are on the screen now, O U star, symmetric square of U star, etc., form a full exceptional collection. And U here is the 
as usual, the tautological subbundle on the Grassmannian, and u star is its dual. Right. Well, more examples will appear later. And another legend about this second part, this uh, Grassmannian KN and Quadrix. So, if I'm not mistaken, this was Kapranov's master thesis, or more like a diploma project, because uh, in the Soviet Union you didn't have master back then. Anyhow, so uh, another remark for this is that, like I said, fullness is somewhat technical, but uh, to check that these guys are exceptional collections, you just use some standard cohomology computations. Namely, for PN, it's just standard cohomology computations of line bundles, I mean, of cohomology of line bundles on PN. And for the Grassmannian, you can use the so called Barrel Ray Bot theorem that tells you uh, the answers for the cohomology groups that you need. All right, and uh, so let's uh, list some simple consequences of having a full exceptional collection. I'll just state them and without any proof, but just to give you an idea that uh, having a full exceptional collection really restricts you, I mean, puts some uh, serious assumptions on X. Well, the first one is that the Hodge numbers of your variety are zero for P unequal to Q. So another one is that in this case, the K0 is a free abelian group of rank N and classes of, of, of these exceptional objects, they form a basis in K0. And uh, uh, the third one is that if you have two ex full exceptional collections in dbx, then they have the same number of objects. And this number N is equal to the rank of the K0, like in part two. And it's also equal to the dimension of the cohomology vector space. Right, so uh, I guess this is a good logical place for questions if you have uh, questions right away about the definitions or examples. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I know uh, also the audience part of the story in the sense that it is very hard to ask questions in online talks and even harder if they are recorded. So I, I understand uh, that uh, it's very um, hard to ask questions. But I, I mean, still feel free to interrupt and I'm happy to, to reply. Anyhow, let's keep going. And so, so we introduced the, the notion of what is an exceptional collection. And for this talk, we will need a special type of exceptional collections, so-called left exceptional collections. And this is a particular kind of exceptional collections that was introduced by Alexander Kuznetsov uh, in his work on homological projective duality around 2006. So let's uh, recall the definition. So we start again with X, a smooth projective variety, but now we also fix a, a line bundle. So you can think of it, we have we are in a Picard and Quant situation and on a final variety, say, and we fix the ample generator of the Picard group denoted by O1. And a Lefschetz collection with respect to O1 is an exceptional collection which has the following uh, block structure. So we start with a with a bunch of exceptional objects, like with an exceptional collection of lengths sigma zero, and we call this a starting block. And I separate blocks by semicolon. So here is a semicolon. And then I take all these objects that I had and twist them all by O of one and maybe throw some of them at the end. So this, this is encoded here in this sigma one being smaller or equal to sigma zero. And then I just keep doing it. I keep twisting what I've started with and keep throwing away the objects at the end. Right, so a collection that has this uh, pattern is called uh, a Lefschetz collection. And this sequence of numbers is called a support partition of the collection. And if all the blocks have the same length, if they all have the same number of objects, then we call such a collection rectangular. So, I mean, maybe it's a bit uh, confusing this explanation, especially uh, via an, an online presentation. So let's, uh, I mean, I'm going to give some concrete examples. Well, let's uh, do again the Bellinson collection on PN. Well, in this case, well, I've added semicolons. So this is our starting block 
And here I'm just twisting the, everything that I had and not throwing away anything. So it means that the starting block is just consists of O and the support partition is just one, 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 one. And let's also do the uh, G24 case. Well, we have, again, the same Capranos collection. Uh, so here we have the starting block consists of three objects. Well, in the next block here, I have thrown away the symmetric square and I've twisted by O of one what was left. And in the last one, I've even thrown away the tautological subbundle and uh, twisted by, by one. So the starting block is these three guys and support partition is three to one. And um, in this example, G24, we can construct also a different collection which has smaller starting block. So in, in this example, which is on the screen now, we have three objects in the starting block, but we can make it two instead of three in the following way. So we start with O and U star, and then we keep them both and twist by one. Now I throw away the tautological and twist. So now it's a, again, a, one can show that it's a full left shift collection with starting block O U star and uh, support partition two, two, one, one. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the definition of left shift collections. And um, note that in the case of projective space, it was a rectangular collection. All blocks had the same length, the same number of objects. And for the G24, it is not rectangular. And yes, small remark here is that Lefschetz collections with the smallest possible starting block are called minimal Lefschetz collections. And sort of the, the main interest for us today is, uh, is these minimal collections that have the smallest possible starting block. So let, let, let us do a small uh, review, so to speak, of what is known about exceptional collections on Gmod P. Well, it will be very rough review, uh, but uh, let's see. So we have a G, a simple, a simple, simply connected algebraic group, and P, a maximal parabolic subgroup, and our X is the quotient Gmod P, so this rational homogeneous space. And uh, I mean, if you're not uh, if you don't like this sort of Gmod P language, you can think of the usual Grassmannians or isotropic Grassmannians in the case when you have either a symplectic form on your vector space or a uh, symmetric non-degenerate form. Uh, so this would correspond to these Gmod P's in classical types. And you also have a bunch of uh, cases for exceptional types G. Right, so Many people have worked on this topic. We already have seen uh, Belinson and uh, Kapranov, but here are some more names, and this list is definitely uh, not full, incomplete, and I've prepared my slide a few days ago, and uh, surely Michelle van der Berg, who is now in the audience, also has worked on this and should be on this list, but uh, my apologies for the list is incomplete. And, um, right, and, uh, what I wanted to say is that despite this, these efforts by all these people, uh, a complete answer is still lacking, like a complete uniform answer, so to speak. And perhaps the most general result is the construction by Kuznetsov and Polishuk of a candidate for a full exceptional collection on, on G mod P in, in classical types, A, B, C, D. And like I said, it's a candidate and so what is not known is the if these collections are full. And uh, in fact, their, their fullness is known in only very few special cases. Right, so this is what is known about just exceptional collections. And now about Lefschetz, even less is known. And in principle, if you discard some very few sporadic separate examples, until recently, there were only three series of known examples, namely Grassmannians Kn, symplectic isotropic Grassmannians 2 to n, and orthogonal Grassmannians 2 to n plus 1. So this is a joint effort, I mean, to, I mean 
in separate papers by Fonarev and Kuznetsov. And um, right, and uh, and for us, uh, we are interested today more in these minimal Lefschetz collections, and so not so much is known in this in this area, and well, there are many interesting open questions. Right, so we are going to now introduce the concept which is uh, which was in the title of the talk, and maybe if someone has questions or complaints uh, about my incomplete list, for example, please uh, go ahead. And uh, or we can discuss it afterwards when the recording is off. So what is the residual category of a Lefschetz collection? So we start with the Lefschetz collection as before, and we consider well, that's the collection. And uh, we can take its rectangular part. It means that I take only those objects which appear in the last in the last uh, block. So I take this sub collection. And I define the residual category of this Lefschetz collection to be the subcategory which is left orthogonal to the to this uh, rectangular part. So I mean, I'm not introducing it formally, but there is a so-called semi-orthogonal decomposition where this R, this residual subcategory, is here on the left, and this rectangular part is automatically by construction on the right. And we have such a semi-orthogonal decomposition of the derived category. And um, well, a small remark is that the residual category is zero if and only if the collection we started from is full and rectangular. So let's let's do some simple examples. I mean the one that we already had. So let's let's do Grassmannian two form. So we consider the collection, the, the one which was, I mean the minimal one, the, the one that I mentioned as the second collection. So this is again this collection that I repeat, and I have highlighted in red the objects which do not belong to the rectangular part. And so what we need to do, we kind of can project them into this residual category to get the following uh, picture. Namely, we have such a new collection with two objects A and B denoted in red. They are now on the very left. And this R is generated by these two objects. So R itself, itself the residual category itself has a, an exceptional collection just consisting of these two objects A and B. And well, let me mention it. That, that, that's a general feature. So if we project the objects not belonging to the rectangular part into the residual category, it gives rise to the to an exceptional collection in the residual category. And the technical name for this is the is mutation of exceptional collections. So this is absolutely general, applies in any situation. But in our particular example, we have the following interesting phenomenon. Uh, uh, for the G24, of course, AB, like I mentioned, is an exceptional collection by itself. So X from B to A all vanish. But what is surprising is that also X in the other direction vanish. And it means that A and B are completely orthogonal. This is a, an interesting phenomenon because uh, a priori there was no reason to expect such behavior. And basically the goal of my talk is to try to illustrate this kind of behavior and try to motivate it by uh, homological mirror symmetry and show some examples. So let's keep going. And uh, well, let's generalize from G24 to GKN. Well, as I already mentioned a few slides ago, min minimal Lefschetz collections for GKN have been constructed by Fonarev around 2011, generalizing early results for G2N by Kuznetsov. And uh, it is beyond uh, possible to recall the construction here, but let me just say that in the G24 case, uh, the construction construction gives back the collection that we, we just had on the previous slide. And motivated by this and uh, the motive, uh, mirror symmetry 
which is going to come later with, with jo in joint work with Alexander Kuznetsov, we have formulated a conjecture, namely that the residual category of Fonarev's minimal Lefschetz collection on GKN is generated by a completely orthogonal exceptional collection. So this conjecture is completely parallel to the observation that we had on the previous slide for G24. And we also proved a particular case, namely that the above conjecture is true if we assume that K is a prime number. And I prepared my slides a few days ago, and uh, since then I've talked to Anton Fonarev, and he told me that he, he has proved our conjecture in full generality, and uh, he's going to put the paper on the archive in the next couple of weeks. So, in principle, I haven't changed my slides, but uh, there is now a new theorem saying that the conjecture is true um, without any assumption on K and N. Right, and um, like I mentioned, this behavior can be motivated um, by looking at quantum cohomology and mirror symmetry. And this is my next goal, to try to explain this motivation and uh, without drawing any pictures. So uh, that's going to be a bit um, difficult, but let's see if it works. Oh, actually, I have one picture, but uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, enough, so to speak. So uh, let's talk a bit about motivation from homological mirror symmetry. So our setting here is that we have X, a fun of variety, and YF, it's landau ginzburg model. So it means that Y is some uh, smooth, smooth variety, perhaps even a fine, and F is just a regular on, function on it. And to say that YF is like landau ginzburg model of X is means that we have such equivalences of triangulated categories. So the Fukaya category of X is equivalent to matrix factorizations of YF, and the DB of X is equivalent to the Fukaya Zeidel of YF. I mean, I'm not going to recall the definition, the full definitions of these categories. I'll just say a few words about this Fukaya Zeidel, as it will be important for my explanation. And, but let's assume a bit more about our setting. So let us assume for simplicity that Picard of X is just Z, and that all critical points of the function f are isolated. So they may be degenerate, some interesting critical points, but uh, they are isolated. Then we, we have the following. So the Foucault's ideal category, uh, whatever the proper definition is, it has a full exceptional collection consisting of the so-called Lefschetz symbols associated with the critical points of f. And uh, at this point, it would be good perhaps to draw some pictures, but um, I don't have any pictures prepared, unfortunately. And uh, another remark is that taking this exceptional collection and the Fukaya given by the Lefschetz symbols into the critical points, in using this green equivalence of categories, it gives us a full exceptional collection in the bounded derived category of X. Okay, so that's that's uh, that's already good, and let's keep going. So, what is the intuition that uh, we use in our work for these uh, residual categories? Well, very vaguely, this intuition can be stated as follows. So we have in the Foucault's idol, we have this exceptional collection given by the symbols, uh, kind of going to the critical points of, of our function f. And uh, I suggest to think uh, about the symbols and the corresponding objects, which which correspond to critical points with non-zero critical values, as giving you the rectangular part of, of our collection in dbx. So again, uh, critical points with non-zero critical value produce you the rectangular part in the db of x. And then the second part of the intuition is that the critical points in the fiber over zero, they give you the residual category. So they correspond to the, to the residual category. So this, this is a bit vague, but it, uh, we'll try to use it as is. Uh, in a second, 
let's do a couple of examples. So first example, let's assume that there are no critical points in in the fiber of zero. Then according to this intuition above, we should expect that in db of x, we have a rectangular left side collection. And say if we take Pn, this is exactly what happens. If you look for the, at the Landau-Ginsburg model of Pn, it only has critical points with non-zero non critical values, and there is even more structure for that. Okay, let's uh, consider a second situation, namely, we assume that now maybe there are critical points in the fiber over zero, but we assume that that um, they are all non-degenerate. And then from here, it automatically follows that the corresponding left symbols, they are completely orthogonal in the Foucault's idle category. And as I mentioned here, the fiber over zero gives us the residual category. So in this case, we should expect that there exists in the derived category, a left shift collection whose residual category is generated by completely orthogonal objects. And this is what happens for Grassmannian KM. And uh, finally, kind of slightly more complicated setting is that when the fiber over zero has several critical points and they are possibly degenerate, then what the above intuition tells us is that we should expect that in the residual category, we'll have a semi-orthogonal decomposition and each piece of that decomposition will be the Foucault's idle category of, the, of one of these singularities in the fiber over zero in the Landau-Ginsburg model. So let's do a particular example when you just have a unique critical point in the fiber over zero. And let's assume that this critical point is of ADE type. Then the above discussion combined with the theorem of Zydel suggests that the residual category should be equivalent to the bounded derived category of representations of uh, the Dinkin quiver of the respective ADE type. So the theorem of Zydel that I mentioned is the theorem telling you that the Foucault Zydel category of an, of an isolated hypersurface singularity of type ADE is equivalent to representations of the quiver of the same type. Okay, so let's that's that's the motivation from homological mirror symmetry. So uh, long story short is that we can read off the Landau-Ginsburg model how the what to expect for the kind of what kind of pattern to expect for the residual category or for the collection in general. And but Landau-Ginsburg models they are not always known or they are, can be hard to work with. And basically what I'm trying to say on this slide is that maybe I'll say it in words is that um, you don't need to know the Landau-Ginsburg model to do this. You can just know the small quantum cohomology and then you can read off of there the structure of the critical points of the Landau-Ginsburg model and it might be just enough to conclude what you want about the residual category. I mean, just to give you some intuition what to expect. So let's maybe not to go too much into this stuff and, and skip it, but point being is that we can look at quantum cohomology, try to see uh, what kind of factors appear in this algebra. So small quantum cohomology in this setting, I think of it as just finite dimensional algebra over the complex numbers, commutative. I decompose it into a product and uh, I mean, so the, I'm kind of using this isomorphism. And so the factors in this decomposition correspond to individual critical points of the Landau-Ginsburg model. And whether or not each factor is just a copy of the ground field or something more interesting corresponds to the point being degenerate or non-degenerate. So let's do an example. So we take a Grassmannian IG 2 to N, which is the symplectic isotropic Grassmannian of two planes. And uh, this is kind of the simplest example in a sense for which the small quantum cohomology has an interesting singularity. And uh, 
a minimal Lefschetz collection. And this case has been constructed by Alexander Kuznetsov around 2005. And for the case n equal to 3, we have explicitly this collection. And as before, well, I forgot to put here semicolons, but uh, so these first three guys is the first block. And, and uh, as before, I'm highlighting in red the objects that do not belong to the rectangular part. And uh, again, mutating them into the residual category, we automatically get this, that uh, residual category has a, a collection consisting of two objects. And moreover, the acts between these two objects look like this. So there is home, which is one dimensional, and all other acts vanish. And this implies that uh, this category is equivalent to the representations of the queer of type A2. And similarly, in the general case, IG2 to N, you will get a, the queer of type AN minus 1. And this matches perfectly with the picture in this in the quantum cohomology side. Namely, if you look at the quantum cohomology and, and you decompose it into the product of factors, then you will have many, so to speak, boring factors of the form just the C, the ground field. And then you will have one interesting factor, uh, which is the Milner algebra of the, sing of the hypersurface singularity of type A n minus 1. And, um, and it should tell us, so to speak, that in the central fiber of the landau ginzburg model, we have the singularity of type A n minus 1. And then by the theorem of Zeidel and the kind of motivation from mirror symmetry, we should expect uh, such equivalence to be there for the residual category. Okay. Any questions at this point? No questions. Uh, let's keep going then. Um, well, this brings me uh, to the next kind of uh, example in this or set of examples. And these are cases of so-called co-adjoint varieties. I'm not going to give the precise definition. I'm just going to give instead a table. Uh, so these are particular cases of varieties of the form G mod P, and you have one variety in each type. So here's a table. And so in the first in the first column, I have the Dinkin type of G. Then in the second column, I have the corresponding co-adjoint variety. For example, you see that in type C, in type CN, we have the isotropic, symplectic isotropic Grassmannian 2 to N that we had on the previous slide. And in the last column, we have the type of the singularity that you see in, in the small quantum cohomology. And, or in other words, this is the kind of singularity that you should be able to see in the, in the fiber of a zero of the landau ginzburg model. And, uh, and just a quick remark that th this list of singularity is a part of the joint work in progress with Nicolas Perrin. And well, there we are studying a different aspect, namely the semi-simplicity of the big quantum cohomology of the, for these varieties. And, um, Right, so let's uh, let's uh, here concentrate on the residual categories for them. And uh, so with all this motivation from homological mirror symmetry and quantum cohomology, with Alexander Kuznetsov, we have formulated a kind of a conjecture for, for the case of co-adjoint varieties, which fits well into kind of this more general pattern, which is the following, is that if X is a co-joint variety, then there should exist a Lefschetz collection in the derived category whose residual category is equivalent to the derived category of the Dinkin quiver of the singularity which appeared in the in the third column on the previous slide. And uh, well, and the the first theorem uh, is the type C, which appeared a couple of slides ago. This is uh, due to Kuznetsov. Uh, in 2017, and uh, this year we have also managed to prove this conjecture for type D, 
which is the grass, orthogonal Grassmannian 2 to n, and also in type A, but modulo some subtlety is related to the fact that the, in type A, this cojoint variety is this flag variety 1 and n plus 1, and it has recurring. There are some subtleties, so let's not. Uh, but there is some uh, kind of uh, there is some precise statement that one can make here, but uh, it will be a bit too much to try to recall it here. And uh, another th another th theorem along these lines is the following, uh, jointly with Peter Bellman's and Alexander Kuznetsov, is that this conjecture also holds in type F four. And uh, yeah, so we have a number of. Uh, so if we combine all of this together and also add this remark, well, uh, remar remark is a bit something different, sorry. So remark is that um, that these are first examples of collections in these types. Um, but what I wanted to say is that, so if we combine these theorems is that with the fact that in types B and G, the conjecture is quite becomes quite simple and known. So what remains are really the, the types E6, E7, and E8. Because all all the other types uh, of I mean in all other types the cojoint varieties are already treated on the screen so to speak, and it's uh, in a sense it's also a work in progress but it's better to say very much in progress and uh, we have some candidates but there is a lot of work to be done. Okay, so I think I'm going faster than I planned, especially since. Uh, there are no questions, and uh, so I'm, I think I'm always almost at the last slide, and uh, so that kind of brings me to my last slide, namely, so we have begun with the Grassmannians 2, 4, and Kn, discussed the conjectures there, and then we talked a bit about mirror symmetry and, uh, and uh, discussed afterwards the cases with some interesting singularities, now let's go back to the case of semi-simple small quantum cohomology, which means that uh, the, the, in terms of the Landau-Ginsburg model, it means that all the critical points are non-degenerate. And so also in, in this in the fiber over zero, which tells us by this homological mirror symmetry intuition that we should expect the following to hold. And this was also kind of a conjecture that we made with Alexander. Uh, some time ago is that if we have a smooth fun variety with Picard uh, group equal to Z, and if the small quantum cohomology is generically semi-simple, then the derived category should have a full Lefschetz collection whose residual category is generated by a completely orthogonal collection. And, and the conjecture for Grassmannian's KN that I mentioned earlier today, in a way is a in a sense, is a specialization of this one. And so here are some known cases for this conjecture, namely Grassmannian's KN that I already mentioned. And again, let me make this remark that uh, Anton Fonarev has just proved it in the full generality and uh, it's going to appear on archive in a couple of weeks. And uh, another case is Quadrix, just follows from Kapranov's work. Then Orthogonal Grassmannians 2 to n plus 1. This is in type B. This follows from uh, earlier work of Kuznetsov. And there are some more sporadic examples. Uh, Grassmannian in type G2 by Kuznetsov. Two examples in type C by students of Alexander Kuznetsov, Lalia Gusiva, and Sasha Novikov. And this is something very recent and, and is not yet on archive but hopefully it's going to be there soon. And uh, the fourth example, so we have also some results in exceptional types, namely this by, by Fiance and Manivel, and uh, our joint with work with Peter Bellman and Alexander Kuznetsov, we know that it holds for, for the Cayley plane, which is a homogeneous space in type E6. And then also uh, examples of uh, Lagrangian, um, Lagrangian Grassmannian or type C Grassmannians, isotropic Grassmannians 4, 8, and 5, 10, should follow from the work of Polishuk and Samochin and Fonarev. 
and uh, but I think it's not written anywhere, but I think I checked and it, it seemed to be correct, but let's let's leave it uh, at this. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm, I'm happy to discuss all possible questions. <laughs>